everyone and welcome to Guts and Glory. I am so happy to be here with you today to, uh, we have a guest today who's pretty incredible, um, obviously incredible because he's an IBD warrior, but also incredible for all of the wonderful things that he's doing um, in the brewing space. And if you're wondering what in the world are we doing talking about beer on Guts and Glory, you're going to see why. I'm really excited for you to all be here and listening. So we have Ted Fleming, who is the CEO and founder of Partake Brewing. Um, And as mentioned, he is an IBD warrior and was diagnosed with Crohn's disease in 2005, right? That's right, Ted, 2005? Yeah, that's right. So tell us, you know, let's start from the beginning. Where did you grow up? You know, what was that kind of like? you know, obviously you were not diagnosed as a child, not necessarily saying that you're old, but you know, you're old like me. Um, so tell us about the before and the after. Sure. So I was, uh, I was born in Vancouver. Um, I was a very underweight baby. I was only two pounds when I was born. So it was a little, little touch and go as to whether I would make it, but I'm here. So <laughs> got through that, um, you know, early childhood, a few years in Vancouver, uh, moved with my family to upstate New York when I was about five, um, spent a year or two there. And then I moved to uh, Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. So a smaller town in Northern Ontario, where I, I grew up from sort of the age of five through high school. Um, That's a big jump from your yeah. other two previous places. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, when you're five, you probably don't realize that, right. that, uh, that change quite so much, but I'm sure it was a big change for my parents. And uh, Sault Ste. Marie was a great place to grow up. It's a you know, a, a great community. It's it's access to the outdoors is phenomenal. Um, so it was a great place to grow up. And then uh, I left left Sault Ste. Marie when I went off to college. I went to Queen's University in Kingston. Um, was there for five years. Um, should have been there for four, but five. And then uh, went and uh, started my career working in in Toronto and and lived uh, about fifteen years in Toronto. And then. My family and I, we moved out to out to Calgary in 2018. So we've been here for about five years. So what you're saying is you are almost back to where you were where you started. Almost. You're almost there. Calgary, Vancouver. <laughs> like, yeah. It's just it's just an hour flight. It seems pretty close. Yeah, it's pretty close. It's pretty close. Okay. So well, that's a lot. Um, and now you're in Calgary and we'll get to, you know, being in Calgary and what's going on there. But so in 2005, you were diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And you know, a lot of our guests have talked about their diagnosis. Like, was this something that took a long time for you? You know, was it something like myself where I just became very ill, ended up going to emerge, saw GI diagnosis came pretty quickly. Um, How was that journey for you? Yeah. Like I think for me, I had, I had some inclinations a few years prior to 2005. Like I, I think I had some autoimmune issues with my skin that Right. You know, I think they were about, a, they were a bit of a warning sign for like what was going on internally. I think, you know, and, and the reason I make that connection is because once I started certain medications for Crohn's, some of those things, some of those things went away. Um, right. So I, I think I had some issues with some autoimmune um, type complications prior to being diagnosed. I think for me, it was, yeah, 2005, I was just sort of getting into the early st- stages of my career. And, um, yeah, it was just started to be tired, had some intestinal issues. I was probably trying to deal with that in like the opposite way you should probably deal with it when, when you have Crohn's. And so you mean like not telling anybody and <laughs> yeah, I was just trying through. to say like, well, yeah, I can, I can go through, you know, I'll eat a lot of fiber. I'll do like, do some things that probably aggravated it more than, more than helped. And, uh, you know, that was just a function of not knowing, but knowing something was wrong and, and, and not really knowing, knowing what it was. And then, yeah, eventually got a diagnosis from my, my GP and saw a specialist and specialist confirmed the diagnosis. And, you know, by that time things had been sort of trending downward. And, um, unfortunately I spent, you know, three or four days sort of on my back without being able to eat feverish, really, really struggling and sort of got out got over that, um, you know, that so a pretty significant flare at that time you were quite, yeah. Happy. Yeah. It was a significant flare and had to take a few weeks off of work and, um, you know, sort of reevaluate things. And then, you know, as, as that diagnosis started to hit home of like, okay, I got to educate myself on, on what this means. And, um, you know, I wouldn't say I was a super quick study. It took several years and, and, uh, 
you know, a lot of trial and error as, on what worked for me and what didn't. And, you know, I would say there's not really a prescriptive path for someone with Crohn's or IBD. Everyone's got their own, own kind of story, their own journey, their own triggers. So, um, you know, there are, there are some, some tools and tips out there for sure, but uh, I think everyone's got to find their own, their own path. And that now, was, did, that was what took time. IBD, like a history of IBD in your family? Were you like the first person? Had, had you heard about Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis before your diagnosis? No, I, I hadn't really. Um, my, my family history does involve um, uh, asthma and diabetes. Right. And as I started to do more research up about sort of the, the genetics around um, Crohn's disease and, and, you know, it, it seemed, it seemed like there was a high correlation in families between those three autoimmune type of diseases. So, um, even though Crohn's hadn't presented itself in my family, it, it, uh, those other diseases had. And so, you know, some of that started to make sense for me as, as I, as I started to research the disease and the uh, triggers. It's interesting that you say that like diabetes is quite rampant in my family actually. So when you, when you made that connection, I was like, "Uh uh-huh. Yep. Just generally, we all kind of, we might not come from a family with IBD in our background, but there's other issues, health issues that are chronic in our, in our life. Um, so, so I'm at 2005, you know, you gave up alcohol. I think you said in 2010, I think you shared that earlier in 2010, you gave up alcohol. Um, my assumption is that was alcohol a trigger for your IBD? I know it is for me as much as I'd like to have a good stiff drink on Fridays. Uh, I, I can't. <laughs> so was that your choice or did you have another reason? Yeah, I think, I think as part of that exploration from like 2005 to 2010, trying to figure out like what's working, what's not. And it became pretty clear to me, despite me not wanting to be so is that, yeah, alcohol was a, was a major trigger for me. And, um, just so, just so the audience knows partake brewing only makes non-alcoholic craft beer. Um, so that's, that's the tie into the story here. That's and, where we're going. <laughs> yeah, me, me giving up alcohol was sort of a, a first step in, in that journey. Right. And you had become a dad, right? Right around the same time. Yes. Yeah, so 2010, my, my first daughter was born and, um, uh, it was, it, it was fantastic, obviously life changing. And, uh, my wife and I, you know, we took some time off with our, our new baby and we went, we went to Europe to spend some time with, uh, with some family who lived there. And unfortunately for me, I, I, I don't know what it was. It, it, it probably was, I was still drinking at that time, maybe not as much, but I, uh, you know, on, on vacation, you kind of let your guard down a little bit and you let I loose. I yeah. I, I think I did that <laughs> a little of that. And, you know, it was a bit of a celebratory vacation as well because of like the new family member and, and so on. And I, I ended up in the hospital and I ended up in the hospital for almost, um, five or six days. And, you know, it was, it was some time to reflect. Yes. In Europe, I had this great view of the Mediterranean sea from my room. That was nice, but (laughs) it's the only positive. Yeah. Clearly not where I wanted to be. And so, (laughs) no, I think that was like, I had five days by myself to kind of just say, okay, where, like, where are things going here? I'm, I'm a dad now you know, I, I really got to get my Crohn's under control. Like I have to take, I have to do everything that I can to, to keep it in check. And, you know, I came out of that saying, Hey, I gotta, I gotta give up alcohol as, as part of this larger shift to taking more control of, of my health and wellness. Now you said, so that there was about a, that's a five-year gap between your diagnosis and becoming a dad and, and ending up in the hospital with your lovely view. Um, did you, during that time, I'm assuming you had to experiment with a lot of different medications. Did you have to have surgeries in that journey? How did, how did you navigate? I, I, I feel sometimes, you know, even myself, I've had IBD now for 16 years. Um, and I feel like we glaze over, like, I'll be like, yeah, so I spent seven years in and out of the hospital. And people are like, what? Um, so how was that five years for you? Yeah, for me, I, I probably had, um, probably, probably had a flare up at least I would say once a year on average in those five years. Um, for me, the big, the big challenge was I had a lot of fistulas um, right. related to Crohn's. So that's where um, for me, surgeries were, were related to uh, fistula activity. So, um, you know, that was, that was the main challenge for me and the main reason for hospitalizations. I did have to go on, um, you know, I started on some 
lower potency medications, mostly anti-inflammatory. Like the 5 yeah. Yeah, moving from anti-inflammatories to, you know, a few, a few flare-ups where prednisone and right. heavy doses of prednisone were required to, to kind of get things back to normal. Um, and then, you know, I think, you know, a few years in, I started on some of the biological medications. And at least for me, those were, those were a game changer. Mm-hmm. Um, I've still had some minor fistula activity, but it's been, it's been pretty controlled. I'd say my, my issues are maybe every two or three years rather than every year now. Um, that's a knock so, on wood for that. Yeah, there we go. So, so, you know, a, a noticeable improvement and, and noticeable management of it. Um, I'd say, you know, what I'm doing work-wise wouldn't be possible with, without, uh, you know, some of those, some of those medications, but also the changes in lifestyle that I made. Yeah, you know what? I, I totally agree with you there. Like I'm, I'm on my second biologic. I'm taking a Tibio now. Um, and they've really been a game changer for me. Like I was on prednisone, methotrexate, um, Imuran, all the five ASAs, suppositories, enemas, you know, oral tablets, all the things. Biologics have really helped me, but also as well, I've realized I needed to take the onus myself to start living better and being better and making choices from the things that I ate, you know, drinking, um, the rest that I allowed myself to have, managing stress, you know, kind of all of those things. It's, you know, taking more of like a holistic approach has really made a difference um, in my disease. And, And that takes us to kind of where you are now because you know, what you're doing now is not, I wouldn't say is the easiest job being an entrepreneur. I'm sure it comes with a lot of stress and requires a lot of balance. Um, you know, you're the number one non-alcoholic, well, not you, but Partake Brewing is the number one non-alcoholic beer brand in Canada and the 14th fastest growing company in Canada. Um, congratulations, by the way. That does not come easily. Uh, doing that while being an IBD warrior and having complications every two to three years, being a dad, you mentioned it was your first daughter. So my assumption is you have more children. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have three three daughters today. So they're 12, 10, and six. So three, pretty active three girls. Oh, bless yeah. you. All the things, dad, all the things. So tell us how this started. You, you know, obviously a big catalyst for you was that you realized, you know, while you're viewing the Mediterranean Sea, that alcohol was not the best option for you. So like, take us through that decision and how in the world it ended up you starting, uh, you know, a non-alcoholic brewery. How did that happen? Sure. So I think just a a little bit before that, like I was experimenting with like, is it beer? Is it the yeast in beer? Is it gluten? You know, started using like drinking ciders instead of beer or wine and, you know, all paths led back to no, it's, it's got to be the alcohol. So, you know, giving that up is, it's hard. Um, You know, anyone who's doing, you know, it's January 31st right now, like anyone doing dry January, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not the easiest thing. It's, it's, it's something that's, uh, it's difficult and takes work. And for me, I found that, you know, I could go two or three months without drinking alcohol, but getting beyond that was very tough because there weren't great, there weren't great alternatives for people that didn't drink. Um, you know, you'd go to a bar or restaurant and they'd, they'd hand you the kid's menu. Essentially they'd say, you know, right. here's Would you you like a water, Shirley and ju- water, juice, <laughs> Shirley temple. If they had a, like a really progressive menu, right. Or <laughs> they had grenadine. <laughs> so, you know, it was, it was a, a really demoralizing experience. You go, I'd go out with my friends. I still socialize, like we socialized over drink. Like when, when one of my friends wanted to go out and like get something off his chest, it's like, Hey, let's go for a beer with code for like, okay, let's go, let's go chalk, let's go connect. And so like having a beer was part of that ritual. And, and so I felt like a bit of an outsider, even times, like I had one experience where, you know, everyone ordered a beer and I was like, no, I'll have water or soda water. You know, I was, I was even trying to be good. And then like the server brought out beer for everyone and put a beer in front of me. And I'm like, okay, like Right. I can't put a beer in front of me. <laughs> not so it's very much it. like a, it's a social habit, really. Right, right. And so I needed, like, I came to the realization, I needed a, a non-alcoholic beer that it looked like a beer. It tasted like a beer. Everyone around me was like, okay, Ted's having a beer with us. He's, he's part of the group. And I think it was just all those factors. And I like to taste a beer as well. So, you know, that was, right. that was a big factor too. But, you know, all these things made me come back to like, I can still feel, I could still feel good in this social situation, I would feel included. 
Um, I wouldn't feel weird or people asking me weird questions about like, why aren't you drinking or why aren't you participating with us? Um, if and I had you're getting a the night. taste that you enjoy. Exactly. exactly. So, you know, that was my realization as I gave up alcohol. And then this was, this was going to be a not a good non-alcoholic beer was going to be that tool I needed to kind of stay on this, this path I wanted to be. And without that, you know, it was going to be much more difficult. Yeah. So my assumption is then you just started drinking all the non-alcoholic beers that were available. Like, just let me try this. Let me try this. Let me try this. And yeah. you discovered at the time that perhaps maybe it just wasn't hitting the mark for you. Yeah. Well, you, you basically went through all that was available. There was basically three or four brands available. There was no variety. Everything was a lager. There was like store brand. There were a couple of European brands and like maybe one North American brand. And that was it. Like you're, your universe of non-alcoholic beer was, was very, Quite very limited. small. And even the stuff on the shelf, you go to the grocery store and, or liquor store and go on the shelf and try to pick up a non-alcoholic beer. And you'd, you'd see there was dust on the shelf and you'd look at the, <laughs> the bottom is like, Oh, this is, this is past its best before date. Great. So <laughs> it's going to try it anyways. <laughs> yeah. Even that part of it wasn't, wasn't a great experience. So the, what I, what I, um, started looking for was someone online that I could buy from, right? Like this was the the golden right. age of commerce. Let's, let's go online and someone's got to be selling non alk beer. Right. So went online and I found a place and I was like, Oh, this is amazing. It's got all these European beers and, you know, throw it in the cart, throw it in the cart, check out. Sorry, we're in the UK. We don't ship to Canada. So, you know, within a day I was like, okay, I'm going to start that same business here in Canada. And amazing. I, I started that within, within three months, I started that business. And I was like, okay, here's the business model. I'll bring in this beer, try to sell it online. And if I don't sell it online, I'll drink it myself. And that'll be, that'll be that. It's a win-win. <laughs> right. So, you know, I rem- so remember- So you were working my- collaboratively with like a UK company, essentially, then you're like, I'll just be the distributor here in Canada for this stuff. No, it was, it was, it was basically, I took that business model and said, Hey, I'll, okay. I'll start an online store. I had to go source all the products. So it wasn't the same product, but I had to go source it myself. And then and then find a warehouse and then find a, someone who could ship it. So I did all that work. Um, and it actually, you know, it actually worked. We, we sold over a hundred thousand dollars of product in the first year. Um, wow. it, it several hundred thousands of dollars of products in a few years. And then I think the real, the real insight and unlock for me was that I was building this community around what I was doing because I was the only only person in North America who was really servicing this community. Like they were experiencing that same lack of choice, that same experience at a bar or restaurant of just being feeling like a second class citizen when they go in there because they don't drink alcohol. So I was someone who was really championing, um, you know, being a champion for them and and making making their world better. And, you know, I, re- I remember one one customer came back and it was actually the wife of a customer. And she said, Hey, look, my, you know, I want to thank you. My, my husband was diagnosed with cancer last week and he's got all his buddies coming over Friday for a barbecue and they always have beer and barbecues. And like with his treatment, he was, he wasn't allowed to drink alcohol. So she was saying like, this was such a big thing for him to just feel like with all this other stuff going on in his life, he could still have a beer with his friends. And that was such a, you know, a, t- a touching moment for me that That's huge. was like, okay, I'm, I'm doing something really important here. Like the, the business aside, I'm, uh, I'm really helping. And so that was, that was sort of amazing and helped us, uh, help me get through a lot of the, the trials and tribulations that happen when you grow a small business. And then as, as things developed, that community started coming to me and saying, Hey, Ted, can you get this product from overseas? And one of the, one of the, like the non-elk dealer, I see what (laughs) exactly. That is exactly it. So they, they started coming to me in like 2015, 2016 saying, Hey, Ted, can you get craft non out beer? And I went out, talked to a few craft breweries and they're like, okay, it's not going to work too small. Right. You know, right. don't quit your day job type of thing. And I'm like, this is my day job. But uh, anyways, that was, that was the key to me uh, or the signal to me to, to try to make my own craft non-alcoholic beer. And that's sort of the, that was the seed that, that grew into Partake Brewing in, in 2017. And were you in Calgary at the time when this, when this happened? No, yeah. I was still in Toronto at that time. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll have to say like, you know, having lived in Toronto and visited Calgary a few times, I think Toronto and Calgary are like solid beer scenes. Um, even if it's non-alcoholic, like they have a good scene there. So both have worked out, but so in 2017, that's when you did a Kickstarter, right? Is that correct? 
Yeah. So we, we did a Kickstarter in, um, yeah, I think it was launched in March of 2017, closed in April. We had a goal of, of raising $10,000 that would help us do our first production run. So we'd already developed the recipe, the branding, things like that. Um, but this was like, how, how can we pre-fund it with, um, with the support of our community and that, that online community that I built in the prior three years, they were instrumental in making that Kickstarter a success. We sold, we, 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 we raised that $10,000 in the first three hours. We ended up raising $30,000 by the end of the month. Um, and we even had some consumer, like some of my, my community members come back and be like, Ted, you know, you, the, the product we launched was our IPA and it's, it's a great product It's a really fantastic IPA. It tastes great. Um, it's only 10 calories a can, but some people don't like IPA. It's very strong for flavor. And this this one guy (laughs) sends me a note and he's like, Ted, I hate IPAs, but (laughs) I'm still, (laughs) I'm still going to buy 10 cases from you to support (laughs) you because I know you'll go on and build and, and make a style that I like. And True to his word, he bought 10 cases and he's like, I give them to my friends who like IPA and That's you know, I did my part and we we were making pale ales and stouts and red ales and blonde ales and hazy IPAs. So, uh, so he's, I'm sure he's we definitely, he's definitely more comfortable now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For but sure. Bless but him for being like, I'm going to order 10 cases anyways, but like, I don't like this. Like you got to be. Yeah, but I think that speaks to like the passion of the community and the fact that they, they really appreciated that value I was bringing to them that no one else at that time was bringing. Yeah. I, I, um, I am not big on like beer tasting. Um, my, my husband is, and my dad, my dad actually has been an alcoholic his whole life. Um, and in the last few years, I'm very proud to say like, he's put that part of his life behind him. Um, and I can't even imagine what that was like for him to do. I could only see from the outside. Um, but he had the same thing. Like he enjoys the taste of beer. Like he just enjoys the taste of beer. Um, and I had purchased, you know, some of your beer, non-alcoholic beer, um, and brought it to him because he's in small town Newfoundland. And, you know, just to see, like, he was like, oh, and like him having to like double check, like he was double checking to make sure that I, I'm like, dad, I'm not like putting you in a lapse here. Like I'm not putting you back to where you came from. Like you're okay. Um, and then just recently, my father-in-law um, spent over 140 days hospitalized uh, for, you know, pancreatitis that went severely wrong. And a lot of the big reasons for pancreatitis is alcohol. And he wasn't drinking a lot or anything, but he's older and was still having a few drinks. And you know, having been in hospital for over 140 days, three different hospitals, airlifted, coded twice, like a lot going on in his life. Um, He's been like, this is it. Like, I'm not drinking anymore. And then of course I was like, well, (laughs) guess what? (laughs) So, so, you know, sharing that story, it's not just like, you know, people with IBD who alcohol is a trigger, you know, people with cancer doing treatments, like there's so many different people out there. And I can't even imagine, like I personally, because I've never been a big drinker for me and I've always been the DD. I always was the one driving everybody home. Um, You're right about the social. And like, for me, it was always like, I would tell my friends about like, oh, I'm driving. And they'd be like, okay. You know, but the times that I wasn't, I felt myself saying, yeah, I'm driving because there was almost like the, why aren't you going to have a drink? And I'm not trying to throw my friends under the bus. Like they're super supportive, but there is a social aspect to it. There really is. Um, And (laughs) beer drinkers are also very specific about their taste. So (laughs) the fact that Partake has now expanded to have how many different types do you have now? Is that even... Uh I think we've, we, we've probably launched about 14, um, wow. in re- okay. in, in like retail, we've got like six, six or seven that kind of sit in retail and then online we sell, you know, seasonal releases, special releases. So, um, you know, always trying to innovate and, right. and use our online channel for that. But in retail, you know, we try to, we try to focus on sort of four to six, uh, six different flavors. So when you made this change. Like, and I'm assuming now you've like officially cut it out and you're just, you're drinking your beer now. This is how it goes. How, and I'm obviously, you know, you've made other changes in your life to get yourself back to wellness. So how, how has your experience been since this change with your, yeah, I, I, you know, like, like I said, I think the, the, the changes to diet. So alcohol, giving up alcohol is probably chief among those. Um, I also tend to 
uh, again, not prescriptive to anyone, but just things that have worked for me, um, tend to eat red meat, um, very selectively, so much less than I'll still eat it, but, but, but try not to make it at home, try to just save it if I'm out or at a friend's house, I'm, I'm flexible to those, to those occasions, but try to limit it at home, tend to eat fish and chicken, uh, as proteins a bit more, um, because of the family history I have in diabetes, I have, I have type two myself. Um, oh. I do have to, do have to manage the, uh, do have to eat a bit more protein and fat at the expense of carbohydrates. So, um, you know, just try to try to adhere to a bit more of a, uh, a balanced diet diet that way with, with a lot more vegetables. Um, so those are, so those are the basic, the macro things for me on a, on a, uh, on a dietary level and a, a change level. Um, you know, I'm still, I was a very high performing athlete before, being diagnosed with Crohn's went through a few years that were very tough there of right. just trying to reconcile like that, that part prior of it was done. Yeah. And, and the next, the next version. And I think I found a good, a good spot today where, you know, I'm, I recognize like, Hey, I can, over, I can overdo it and put myself into, into a bad spot. So just finding that medium enough medium of, you know, I'm, I'm getting enough exercise again, the social aspect of it's great. The physical aspect of it's great that mental break aspect from, you know, a, a pretty high functioning job. That's, that's very important too. So just really being purposeful and mindful about how much I'm exercising and to what intensity and making sure I, I fall within like, here's the minimum, but here's the maximum and don't sort of don't overdo when it. I was younger, I tried to go too much and do too much. And it's like, okay, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to train, train for this tournament or I'm going to train for the event and like intense, intense, intense in a short period of time. And that doesn't work for me quite as, as much as it used to. But, you, know, you know what? I just turned, I, I don't care. I'm not ashamed of my age. I just turned 36. So I'm also like grappling with same thing I did. I was pretty heavy into volleyball. Um, and then that life changed for me because I was diagnosed at 20. So I was right in the middle of university and that was a big, big change for me too. But I've, I'm also realizing like, I'm not just navigating, I'm being chronically ill with more than one chronic illness, but like, I'm also getting old and like, <laughs> And sometimes I say, like, I wonder, like, is this because of my age or my disease? You know, um, I wish somebody would come in and be like, don't worry, it's just because you're getting old. You're OK. Um, but I don't think that's the way that it is. You mentioned carbs. Obviously, I had no idea about your type 2 diabetes. So you're just navigating all the things. Um, in addition to partake being uh, non-alcoholic beer, I'm fairly certain it's also quite low calorie and low carb. So I feel like you're hitting a whole nother market with that as well. Yeah. So I, I, th- I think like the way, like we talk in, talk about our, our product is yeah, we're, we're non-alcoholic craft beer. Um, but like number one, like we think our product is the best tasting non-alcoholic beer in the world. And we've actually won the world beer award for the world's best non-alcoholic beer. So oh, time, we've time out for a second here. There's, there's beer awards, world beer, like beer Olympics, yeah. beer Olympics. Yes. This we won the gold. Yes, for the non elkies I love it. Congratulations. That's what plus what is this? I need, like I need to yeah. know about so, this. So we've got uh we've got the hardware to prove it. Um but you know, I think more so than that like we just hear it every day online social listening of people who are like I can't believe how great this tastes. It's like just as good as the alcoholic beer I drink if not, you know, better. Right. You know? <laughs> so, you know, we've the proof is in the pudding like all our products taste phenomenal. Um, it's a fantastic taste experience. And then layered onto that is, yeah, we, we created a product that tastes that great, non-alcoholic and all of our products fall within a range of like 10 to 30 calories a can and like zero to eight grams of carbs. So maybe it was kind of like a little, a little fate, but you know, I wasn't type two diabetes when I invented the product, but you know, it's, it's obviously something that really, um, appeals to people who are on keto diet, people who are trying to ma- manage sure. their carbohydrate intake. I can drink two or three beers by themselves. And, you know, I have one of those, uh, those monitors and it doesn't do anything to my blood sugar. So, um, you know, I yeah. think it, uh, it hits the mark certainly with those communities, but I'd say more broadly, right. Like, you know, when you're, when you're consuming a beverage, right. Like you're, you're often saying, does it taste good? And is it low calorie? I think most people today are looking yeah, for those, it's a big two, one. Yeah. those two attributes. And, you know, we have a non-alcoholic beer that, uh, that hits those, uh, in spades. 
So that's definitely like what's led to the success. Obviously that, that, that group that you had at the beginning when you were, you know, for lack of a better term, being the dealer, um, obviously that group was pivotal in helping you achieve success that you have now, but you know, the, just the climate in general, and just like that, the beer that it's, it's low carbs and it's, you know, all of these different things. Granted that happened after your, then you were diagnosed with diabetes. There's a lot happening here. I feel like that's another episode. Um, but clearly that's what's led to the success. Do you think there's anything else, great tasting, low carbs, all of those things, anything else in addition that has really led to the success? Because, and in addition to that, can you let us know, because I'm pretty sure you're now North America, if I am correct. So. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, th- I think there's two things, right? Like the, the product itself being, you know, materially better than what was there before. I, you know, I told the story about no variety, That's uninspired right. taste. Right. Like we've, we've, you know, we've fixed that problem. We've solved that problem. Um, but in parallel, you know, there's, there's been this huge attitudinal shift in society around drinking, particularly with lo- younger generations of, you know, alcohol not being as, as central in social occasions. It's much more acceptable for someone to go into a social situation and say, hey, I, I don't drink or I'm not drinking because it's dry January or it's dr- sober October. Um, you know, the social acceptance of being sober, whether it's a full time thing or a part time thing um, is way higher. It's even, you know, it's 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 even uh, trendy to the point where I've had someone when I said I'm sober, someone said, are you real sober or trendy sober? <laughs> You know what? I have to say the new generation, the generations coming up are, they are a lot better. I think I agree for sure. Yeah. So there's, there's this, there's this parallel path of like, okay, society's tra- changing and people today are looking at, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to still maybe drink alcohol, but I'm going to, I'm going to reserve that to like Friday, Saturday and the rest of the week, I'm going to drink something like partake where it's like, it's low calorie. I'm not drinking, I'm not drinking um, alcohol. So it's like, definitely healthier from that perspective. And you feel you know, okay seen, the next day going into the yeah, office. Yeah, like it's functional. Um, and we've seen all this new new research and guidelines around like what's the what's the safe limit of alcohol. And I think, you know, the the bottom line is there really isn't any safe level. It's all, it's just a matter of a, a matter of degree. And so, you know, I think people are looking at, look, I can have this seamless taste experience. I can go home after work and have a beer and it feels like I'm having a beer and I have that same kind of like disconnect. Or I can have that social occasion and have a non alcoholic beer in my hand and feel like that was like a really enjoyable experience from the product I was drinking point of view, but also from that social connection point of view. And so people are looking at non alk as just a tool in their toolbox to say, hey, I can I can live a healthier life. I can be more present. And yet I'm still enjoying that that beer experience. And then, you know, they'll they'll reserve that alcohol experience for the for the weekend when they, you know, maybe have a yeah, little bit more have time. Yeah, you don't have so much. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to have so much grenadine in the form of Shirley Temple. Not to throw shade at Shirley Temples. I love them for sure, but I feel like too many Shirley Temples gives you a different version of a hangover. Um, so that's probably not a good idea. So you mentioned guidelines. So for our listeners who are outside of Canada, or maybe even listeners in Canada and then don't know what's going on, um, Health Canada has just recently changed their guidelines around alcohol. So um, I think this is the first time it's been changed since 2011. I think I read somewhere, I can't remember, but so Health Canada's guidelines previously to most recent was um, you're okay to have two alcoholic drinks a day. And I remember like reading this and being like, what? Like (laughs) they said, that's okay. (laughs) Like I picture when I was a kid and, you know, cartoons were smoking, you know, like that's kind of like my vision of how I had. Um, And they've changed that from, you know, it's, it's not okay to have two drinks a day you know, minimal effect is if you have two alcoholic drinks a week now, that's so drastic change. Like, you know, it's, it's not even going from one a day or two every, every other day. It's, it's two day, two a day to two a week. So I'm assuming something like that also works in the favor of the success of, you know, your organization, your, your company. Um, so I would assume you like that. I feel like you're in the right place at the right time. And the rest of the world is finally waking up to some of the health benefits, obviously, of, of non-alcoholic beverages. So tell me a little bit about that and how you feel. Yeah, I, I think for me, the bottom line is is just, I think it just raises raises the flag is of like, okay, look, you, you, 
you need to, anyone needs to make just informed decisions. And I think this is, um, you know, giving consumers information that they can choose to use or choose not to use or, 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 you know, do what, do what works for them. But, um, you know, I think it is helpful for people to have just like it was for, you know, other substances of, of, of have, of having the proper information in your hand to make informed decisions. Um, I don't think that's, that change is going to change things overnight, overnight for our business. Yeah. I think it's going to have maybe a 10 year impact of people. And I think you're, again, you're starting to see that in younger generations who probably are just more aware of the, and, and more, um, health conscious you know, in tune, health conscious mm-hmm. with, with the impact of alcohol on, on health. So, you know, I, I think again, like those younger generations coming up, will have this information out there and available to them front and center. Um, so I think over, over a longer period of time, that will definitely have an impact and help our business. Um, but, um, I don't, I don't think overnight it's going to change no. things. For people. I think they're going to kind of, you know, it'll be in the back of their mind as they make decisions. And maybe when they buy a six pack of uh, beer, instead of buying that second six pack, they might pick up a six pack of partake. Well, I'm also thinking like it's, you know, having these guidelines in place is it's great for the individual who can make choices. But I also feel like over time it will inform society in the way our structures work. So in terms of our, our, you know, restaurants and our businesses and clubs and bars and those types of things, being aware of this, being aware of these new guidelines that are clearly out there, they're not hidden. Like it's, it's, this is the science. This is what we figured out. You know, I would hope we would then see more non-alcoholic beverages like partake available regularly. You know, it, you used, I remember as a kid being able to smoke in restaurants and then it turned into smoking section versus non-smoking section, which was literally just like, there was a plant between you and the other person, you know? So, and like, like structures changed with guidelines, you know? Um, and I, I know I've been to like restaurants where yes, they'll have like a mocktail section or non-alcoholic beverage section, but I've also been to places where like, that's not an option. It's like, let me just slap, here's the wine menu, the wine and beer menu. Um, and then, you know, we also have Coke and water essentially. Yeah. yeah I think, I think you're seeing more like you're definitely seeing more, um, non-alc sections within menu. It's definitely improved from like where it was three, five years ago. Um, definitely moving in the right direction. Are there still a ton of places that I have to ask, do you have a non-alcoholic beer? And then they might say no, but then, you know, in half the in half the cases they say, yes, it's like, and then it's like, why isn't it on the menu? Like, why don't you, <laughs> why don't you, on. why don't you tell people that, right? Like, how are you going to sell something that you don't even put on, That's put right. on the menu? Like, so, you know, I think there's still a lot of, a lot of room to run a lot of um, evolution of menus and, and, you know, the, the attitudes towards non-alc are changing. I think many ways, you know, the alcohol industry and, and businesses that, that, you know, were supported by, by alcohol, you know, we're, we're a little hesitant to come to, to non out fearing that, you know, it was, it was a threat. I think, I think the way you're seeing consumers use our product and alcohol and, you know, largely being flexible consumers around drinking both. I think it just makes a lot of, just makes a lot of business sense today for, for places to carry both because that consumer is who knows when they're coming into your, your bar or restaurant or your retail store, they could be buying both. They could be buying non-alc in that occasion. They could be buying elk. So you know, I think you're, as a business, you're, you're probably in a, the best spot if you're, if you're serving both. Um, yeah. You need to have an inclusive space. Like everybody yeah. is, I think everyone has a right to an inclusive experience, like no matter where they go from whether what they're drinking, anything really. So if we're in Canada, for our listeners who are in Canada, where do we get your beer, non-alcoholic beer? If we are in the United States or in any other places, how how does that work? Because we do have listeners all over the world, so I I can already think hear people being sure. like, ah. <laughs> so yeah. How so how does that work? Yeah, I'll start with Canada. So in Canada, we are pretty much, excuse me, in every every major retailer in Canada. So we're in we're in Lob, we're in Loblaws Superstore, we're in Sobe Safeway, we're in Metro, we're in the LCBO, we're in the beer store, we're in BC BC Liquor. Um, tons of independents, co-op, uh, I'll give a shout out to co-op, uh, uh, grocers here in Calgary, regional, uh, grocery <laughs> player. we're in Wal- we're in Walmart as well. Costco's coming, 
coming on board hopefully this year. So, um, you know, pretty, pretty extensive, uh, access. Now just a question and, moving into Costco. Are you going with larger cans? What's happening when you go to Costco? <laughs> Not larger cans, no. <laughs> More, more cans per pack, but no. okay, there we go. There we go. It's, that's the Costco life for sure. Yeah. All right. Now, if you're in the U S how's that working? So the U S is, a. um, we're not quite as well developed, but we are in, in some major retailers. We're in, um, whole foods in a number of regions. We're in, uh, Wegmans in the Northeast. We're in target across a whole, whole bunch of States, which is, which is really exciting. Um, uh, we're in a, a liquor retailer called Total Wine and More, which is across 25 different states. We're in a retailer called Bevmo, which is a multi-state uh, liquor retailer. And uh, on both sides of the border, um, if you can't find us at retail, you can get us at drinkpartake.com. So we can do e-commerce across uh, across both countries as well. That's perfect. So we will definitely be sharing drinkpartake.com on our socials, just like getting that. Um, it's a good thing that we've had a full explanation because people, I could see people being like, what is she doing over there at Guts and Glory with this? <laughs> um, so before you go, first of all, it has been such a pleasure. Um, I, from a fellow IBD warrior to another IBD warrior, I am, I can't believe that you have done all of this, um, navigating, being, having Crohn's disease, starting your own business, going from a dealer to starting your business. I am sure the journey we glazed over, you know, you creating a beer that tastes delicious. We kind of glazed over that trial and error, but I'm sure it was quite difficult. Just slipped in there that you were also diagnosed with type two diabetes. And, you know, you're a dad of three girls, kind of all these things. Um, it's pretty incredible what you're doing. I, I'm sure people tell you all the time that, you know, you should be super proud of yourself and you're doing amazing things, but truly mean it. Like, what an incredible human being. I'm so grateful that you've joined us today. I wish you, your family, you know, Partake Brewery, Brewing, all the success, all the success. I'm definitely going to dabble some, I'm, I'm a blonde fan and I believe you have a blonde beer. I do. Yeah. So I'm going to dabble some more in that uh, just because why not? Look at me. Um, but before we go, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners, whether it's IBD related or, you know, journey to, you know, transitioning to having non-alcoholic beer, sometimes social, anything, if there's anything you'd like to share, feel free. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I'd like to say that, um, you know, I think for the community out there, like, I, th I hope my story shows that, you know, you can persevere and you can have success even, even with Crohn's. I know it's, I know it's difficult. It's been difficult for me. It's everyone's got their own, own journey, but there is, there is, and can be light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, I think that's, that's an important takeaway. And then, you know, what I'd ask of the community listening is, um, you know, when you go out to a bar or restaurant or, or to a retailer and, you know, you know, if you don't see a non-alcoholic section on your menu, um, you know, help us on this mission, help us, help us make it more yeah. inclusive for others to ask and say, Hey, why not? I know, I know a great brand and a great, a great, uh, company with, with a great story called Partake Brewing, and I'm sure they'd love to, to work with you guys. So, um, any help we, we can get from the community, um, we'd be very grateful for that. I love that. Get some glory listeners. You just heard, you just heard it here. Okay. Everybody hit the ground. Get out there in your communities. Let's help Ted out, um, which ultimately helps us out. Um, but yes, Ted, thank you so much for being here and taking the time. Clearly, you're a very busy man, so you probably need to get back to the busyness of your life. Um, but thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, that's it, everybody. Thank you for being here and listening to this episode. Um, I learned a lot. I'm certain you did as well. Um, in addition, I just wanted to mention, uh, we will be sharing on our social media pages as well. Um, if any of you are having trouble with alcohol uh, abuse, that there are, you know, local and countrywide organizations, phone numbers, websites that you can go to to get help um, if you do need help when it comes to any type of substance abuse. And know that you are worthy and we want you here and we want you healthy. Um, and you can still have the great taste of beer if you drink Partake. So thanks everyone. Peace. Um, I hope you have a wonderful time until we're back with our next episode, Strength and Positive Thoughts. The information on this podcast is not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. 
All information contained on or related to this podcast is for general information purposes only. 